What's up and welcome to another episode of the Grindline Podcast. You are listening to episode 194. I'm Ron Burgundy. I don't I didn't look at what our episode was. I'm pretty sure 194, but it's like your one job coming into the episode to no, know no. what number we are. No, on. no, no. I have several jobs coming into the episode. I hope it's you like the, the first new music. Thing you have to do. I it's okay. New season. This is actually the first episode of what I'm considering the new season, even though we haven't played yet. But we do have new theme music, and I like it. And we had a mini vote on Discord. Mm. And uh, it, it came down to like two different choices and uh, the one won. So I like it. And if you like it, let Wait, us know. Which one won? I the metal one, Ryan. Nice. There we go. I don't know that. You didn't say. Yeah, we have a new sweet metal intro. So I hope you like the new intro. But how are you guys doing tonight? We got uh, there's actual hockey on TV. We're going to the home opener on Friday. How pumped is everyone? I am pumped, but also terrified because it's going to be a sausage fest at my house for the next couple of days. Got Thursday night, Tyler, or it's actually Thursday morning, Tyler and his dad are flying in from Boston. And then at some point in the day, I've got Brandon making his way in from Grand Rapids. Pete will be making his way up from Columbus. Everyone is seemingly staying the night at my house on Thursday night. And then we all will go about our day on Friday. But I'm excited. It's pumped to see Tyler and his dad. Pumped to see people at a Red Wings game because it feels like forever. It's I'm good. Hockey's on, like you said. Let's go. Yeah, I, I, I can't wait, man. You know, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be a blast. I'm, I'm just I'm so thankful that that you know this is happening this year. Um, you know, after not knowing whether it was going to happen or not. Um, like I said, um, very thankful. Can't wait to see everybody. Um, you know, big 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 plans. Um. And, uh, you know, just the home opener hockey's back. I mean, you can't be any more excited than that. I mean, this is, this really is the best time of year. You got the baseball playoffs, hockey coming back, college football, the NFL, like this, this, this is among the best times of the year. So speaking of baseball playoff, did you see that walk off a little bit ago? Holy shit. Mariners shit the bed and the Astros walked it off. The Mariners shit the bed almost as bad as the Blue Jays did. That was beautiful. Toronto suffrage. Ugh, in, suffering. in every sport. Yeah, that way, suffering. Every sport, just because of the fan base. Except for basketball. Really, really, it's just because of the Leafs fan base makes me hate the rest of Toronto sports. It's like a, it's like a cancer that spreads to the other professional sports, and basketball so far has been able to avoid it, but it's creeping into baseball. The Blue yeah. Jays are t- slowly getting the Leafs sickness. And it, it's hard to really cheer against them because it's been a while since they've really, I mean, what, nine, 1990, 91? Is that when they won the, the World Series last? So, I mean, Detroit's been longer than that at this point, but you, you kind of, Toronto's been an enjoyable team to watch, but then you're, you're like, I hate the Leafs, so fuck them. Yeah, I mean, they're in the same division as the Red Sox. And as you guys know, I'm a Red Sox fan. And yeah, that's, uh, that's a new level for you. I don't in particularly hate the Blue Jays, but I mean, I guess since they're in our division, I kind of do. I don't know. And they can all thank Steve Simmons for that because he's a colossal turd. So we have a lot to talk about tonight. We kind of have our preseason primer, like season opening primer to go through. We have the 23 man roster. There were some surprises. We have some tweets of note from today from Max Boltman in uh, the practice. And uh, we kind of have Jay Fresh's su- like suggested what's going to happen. Like, here's the points for the entire league. Same thing with Max. He made his predictions, not point wise, but standings wise. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about tonight. And then we are going to look forward to the season. So the Detroit Red Wings did release their 23 man roster. They assigned players Taro Hirose, Kyle Criscuolo, UC Okonora, Giovanni Smith, and uh, Jeremy Biakoduko is actually released from his amateur tryout. So all those other players that, that I named. Yeah, all those other players I named were sent to Grand Rapids, and Jeremy Biakoduko was released. Now, there is no announcement of Grand Rapids give, like giving him a contract or offering him a contract. He was offered a contract from the Chicago Wolves, which is the Carolina Hurricanes AHL affiliate. He was actually offered that while he was playing preseason with the Red Wings. So did not know that. So maybe that's like the likely uh, 
scenario there for him? Well, Grand Rapids could still offer him something. And I'd right. almost be surprised if they didn't because he performed really well during the tournament. He did good during preseason and training camp. And he seems to have some promise there. So maybe the Red Wings say, hey, don't take that Chicago offer. Go back to juniors for a year and we'll sign you to something next season. And because I, like you, we had talked about Grand Rapids is getting pretty packed currently and he might not get a lot of playing time there with guys like Emil Vero Edvinson's in Grand Rapids now. Uh, you've got a ton of defensemen down there, Albert Johansson. So there's Johansson, not a, yeah, there's not a ton of room. Camper. Yeah. So maybe, maybe they'll tell him, Hey, go back to junior for a year. And then we got a contract for you after. And because they put a lot of work into him. I mean, not a lot of work, but enough inviting him to camp, putting him through camp, putting him through the tournament, putting him through preseason. And he seems to have a decent amount of talent enough to be able to at least make an AHL team. So we'll see what happens there. Giovanni Smith did pass through waivers, as did UC Okanora. And who else was the one that actually had to pass through waivers? I think it was just those two. Uh, Chris Giolo. No, I think there's a few others. No, Hiroshi and Chris Giolo did too. Yeah, but it's, it's, I mean, really, they were with the glut of every other team going through waivers and getting cuts to get the roster size down. So, I mean, I wasn't necessarily worried. If this would, if you would have said like last year or two years ago, seeing Giovanni Smith get sent through waivers, I would have probably been maybe worried, but he was exempt. So he's maybe the only disappointment, I think, out of that group for me. But that's, a, a bit of a stretch. I mean, I like the way that the physicality and stuff that he brings, but last season it seemed like he was on the ice. He was in the box. There wasn't much in, in between there. Yeah. I think it was the same during preseason too. He just, he fought and like took a dumb penalty and they're like, ah, oh, well, guess what? We're going to give up a goal. So I understand why Giovanni Smith didn't make the roster. There are guys that were better than him that did make the roster. And I can understand why he wasn't claimed on waivers. We get this every year especially at the beginning of the season where waivers happen. Like there's a huge list of waivers for like the last like two days of the preseason because teams got to get down to their 23 man roster. And then everyone jumps online and starts making up scenarios on why we should claim this person and where this person would fit in and that, oh my God, why'd you wave this guy? He's going to get claimed automatically. And you kind of don't sweat it because if you didn't know for people listening, when you claim a player off of waivers, they need to be on your roster for the entire season, uh, depending on when you pick them up. So if you if someone were to waive someone in the middle of the season or the waiver period, when the team picks them up, they've got to keep them on the roster. If you were to try and trade that player, you have to offer him to every other team that put a claim in on him when he was waived first. Yeah, but what about the players that are on waivers multiple times a year and get claimed by different teams? You can waive that player again, but when you pick a player up, they have to be on your roster. You can't ship them down to the AHL. Oh, okay. So they, they can only be put on waivers again? Yeah. So that's. It was that's, like when the Wings picked up But if they clear, then they can year. go to the AHL, right? Yeah. If it, the moment they get sent down, the likelihood is that. The team, if it was if in that 30, that within the 30 day window, the team that waived him originally has immediate dibs to bring him back. That's what we saw with Jameel Smith last year. Detroit picked him up from Tampa. He was there for a short while, but Detroit ended up waiving him again to send it for the move to the minors, and Tampa took him back. Didn't that happen with Eric Comrie too? I uh, forget offhand. Yeah. So that's the thing is that you don't want to commit to a player at the last minute when you're trying to set your rosters. Now, there were some waiver claims because there are teams that do need the roles that those people filled, but you're not going to see like a bunch of waivers and then all those people get claimed. And Giovanni Smith, he's passed through waivers before he passed through waivers again. So it's not really a big deal. Uh, there were some players placed on injured reserve, Robbie Fabry, Mark Pissick, Seth Barton and Jake Wallman. We knew Fabry, Pissick, and Wallman were going to LTIR. I did not know that Seth Barton was injured, but he is also going to go to the injured reserve. Yeah, where'd that come from? No idea. I know he played uh, in Yeah, in he was pre-season. in preseason. I, I don't know. He went to injured reserve that he was one of the players on the list on 1010. Huh. 
yeah, that was that was also my reaction. Um, but the Red Wings 23 man roster was released at forward. You have Philip Zadina, Jacob Verana, Andrew Kopp, Lucas Raymond, Pia Suter, Michael Rasmussen, David Perron, Tyler Bertuzzi, Oscar Sundquist, Dylan Larkin, Adam Ernie, Dominic Kubelik, Joe Valeno, and our Lord Elmer Soderblom has made the 23 man roster. It was a long shot, I believe, at the beginning of uh, the prospect tournament. I had given him literally a 0% chance of making the team. A little bit later on, I upped him to a 30, then an 85, and then he made it. So Now, wait a minute. You went with an 85% chance? uh, Yeah, I think when... By straight coincidence. (laughs) <laughs> no, I don't think I did it that way. Yeah, you see what you did there. I, 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 I didn't exactly do that on purpose. Did. I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's, it's just a coincidence that he is also number 85. I didn't yeah, do sure. it on purpose. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Is it a number that he's going to stick with, though, or you think it's just, you know, the that kind of first-year number? It's a big different. number for a big guy. It. Yeah. It, Peter Klima was the last Red Wings player to wear number 85. Uh, and the only other Red Wings player to wear number 85. But Elmer makes the team, and he was skating on a line with Michael Michael Rasmussen and Oscar Sundquist. What would, a big line. Yeah, it would be the giant line, apparently. <laughs> but I, I think it was a long shot for him to make it, but he kept proving again and again when given the opportunity and told to do something. He went out and did it in spectacular fashion, and I think what sealed it was his absolute just toying of a guy in the offensive zone and then just swooping in in just the sickest backhander right into the goal. And it was beautiful after manhandling what looked like a child. And I I think the, the, he's going to be special. Now, what's happening, and for him, I, I feel sorry because... I mean, I don't feel sorry. I make a ton of money. But for him, I feel sorry because people are now way, 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 way overestimating him, I think. I think what's happening now is people are like, oh, he should he's going to be a top line player. He's going to score 40 goals and win the Calder. I let's really, really, really pump the brakes there, because I still think in the end. Elmer Soderblom is going to be probably he, he has the possibility of being one of the best third line players in the league. He has a very rare combination of size and hands. His foot speed still not the best. His skating, though, it has improved. He's not fast. That's the thing. So that's what's going to stop him most likely from breaking into a top six role is being able to keep up with those other top six players. And maybe he at some point sees some second line time because of injury. He will see power play time, as noted today by Max uh, in practice. He should see power play time. But I think people need to kind of pump the brakes in thinking that he's going to be like this huge 35 goal scorer and and going to win the Calder. I think if he's a 10 or 15 goal scorer, you'd be more than happy um, considering he's coming from Sweden, playing on that bigger ice surface. Um, You know, obviously, I I think like a lot of people talk about the foot speed thing and like like that can be improved upon, especially if he gets like a skating coach in the offseason or, you know, goes into something like that. I mean, he's got long ass legs. Um, One thing I learned playing hockey myself is like, you know, I was taking shorter strides. And as soon as I had a a skating coach is like, hey, take longer strides, use your, your size to your advantage. I wasn't the fastest guy in the world, but my skating certainly improved. And that's that's obviously something that Elmer Soderblom, I'm sure, can can work on and will work on. Um, he doesn't need to work on size. I'll tell you that right now. He doesn't need to put on weight or anything like that. So, I mean, 6'8", 246, he'll ball, he'll he's a moose. Up. He'll get some he'll get some meat on those bones. He's going to be like 6'8", 275 and just <laughs> bowling over people. <laughs> I'm absolutely not worried about his skating because we've already seen it this year with Cider. Last year, he was, I don't want to call him slow, but he wasn't the fastest. And like going for loose pucks or having to retreat back and go like in a foot race with somebody, it seemed like he either barely got there before the guy or was getting beat back by a fo- an opposing forward. This year, it's already obvious the work that he's put in in the offseason 
that he is for one, he's gotten, he looks bigger and mean stronger and he's, you can, his foot speed and really just overall speed has gone up. He's moving up and down the ice so much more smooth. I feel like than last season. And that's what you can only hope for with a guy like Soderbloom and his size and getting things to come together for him, which give it a year. I'm not this year, whatever he does, I'm really not too, as long as he doesn't come out there and shit the bed, I'll, I'll be good with it. But so we'll see. And if he does, he'll be in Grand Rapids. I mean, so it's, it's oh, yeah. not, it's not, it's not like, a bad thing either way. Yeah, exactly. It's not a bad thing either way. I mean, he's going to get his what eight games you think, and then it, they'll make a decision on him. Yeah. Cause that, I mean, the, the, what you're going to end up running into here to that point, you got to anticipate the fact that we could see Edmondson at some point this year, potentially Johansson as well. So that's going to be two guys, three guys that you're now needing to make sure you're not burning that year of ELC because then you're going to have all these guys coming up at the exact same time. And if a few of these guys that we're talking about hit it off, they're going to be looking for some money out of their ELC. So that's going to have to be something that, Stevie manages appropriately. The good thing is, too, is as you talk about like Soderbaum making the team, he doesn't need to go out there and be, you know, a 40 goal scorer or even a 25 or 30 goal scorer. If he goes out there and he's a filler player, this th- he's going to be a cheaper alternative than like a guy like Adam Ernie or even Oscar Sundquist going forward. Um, you know, he's he's obviously not going to be, you know, he wasn't a first round pick or anything crazy like that. But like right you know, the opposite. in terms of of the, pushing the rebuild forward and, you know, getting a team like starting to build the foundation of the team, um, you know, you need to start hitting on players like this. And the fact that he made it as a sixth round pick, I mean, that that in itself is is fantastic. Yeah. And I think going back to Ryan's point about Mo, did you see uh, Derek Lalone on Spit and Chicklets? I haven't listened to it yet, but I, I did see the po- the video that they posted for him talking about Cider. Yeah, so he was asked about Mo Cider. He's like, is he what you had imagined him to be? He said he's way more. He said the, the guy just want he is hockey. Mo Cider is hockey. He said during the game with the, the Penguins where they played excellent and they commanded the game and they should have won that game. But as we had said last episode that Jari and Des- like DeSmith was lights out during that game. He's the only reason they won. He said, going back to the locker room, even though it's a preseason game and even though they should have won and even though they played really well, Mo was absolutely dejected. He was upset that they had lost. And it's just the guy is, he's going to be an absolute monster this season. And uh, he's going to make Dom eat his stupid chart that he made. So, yeah, for yeah, not even going to touch on that. But did you see, so actually, no, going back to that, Point about being dejected. Now it's nice to put that together because remember Malone had actually mentioned that the players were upset that they had lost. Putting a face to that, I think, ups that even more. Meaning that shows you who's starting to stand out for this team. And I know a lot of people are already wishing and hoping that the A's are going to go to a guy like Cider or whatnot early on. Give it time, it's going to happen. But that shows you the impact that he's going to be making on this locker room moving forward. And being with a guy like Ben Sherrod, who's been around there for a while, I, he is hit with him and Mata. There, he's going to be in very good hands on that back end for learning to do things the right way and truly come into his own as professional. And there's Ryan with quote number one of the night, hands on the back end. But You're welcome. I think that in in for again for those who had not seen the announcement, uh, Mo Sider will not get an A this season. They're, they're Wait, not. Did going, they actually announce the A's? They did not announce the A's, but there's was the report that Sider is not getting one. So I missed that too. Yeah, I don't. I don't think th- that that's a big deal. To it's be not, and honestly, you shouldn't put that pressure on him. Yeah, I think a lot of people making more of a big deal of that than it needs to be. I mean, you already have like a relatively young captain like to have some veteran assistant captains is probably um you know probably the way to go um and yeah you know, i'm not saying larkin is is like young young but i mean he's still you know not that old at all you know and in terms of captains he's probably one of the younger captains in the nhl right now so um you know i i don't see the need of 
of p- making a guy like Cider or Raymond in their second year an assistant captain. Now, and the other thing is too, like even if those guys are leaders, you can still be a leader and not wear a fucking letter. Like the 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 whole like thing of you need to wear a letter to be a leader, like bullshit. Like no, you get the letter because you are a leader. You are already the leader, and that's why you were given the letter. People used to say this about Pavel Datsuk and Henrik Zetterberg, and those guys, um, you know, they, those guys weren't the most vocal guys in the world, but those guys led by example. And and there was other guys in that locker room like Cronwall and Franzen and, and guys like that that were more vocal and like Holmstrom and and those guys. So, I mean, you don't need to have a letter to to be a leader. I don't know where that ever came from. I don't even know the the right way to put it. It's just a rite of passage, if you will, for people to have, like for folks to have that on their chest, guys to have an A or C. And it shows that they've been rewarded for what people see. So him not getting it makes it seem like maybe there's something more to maybe why he doesn't have it. Where in the reality is, is that there's guys that have been around for a very long time that fit that role are the ones that guys on the team are looking up to not saying that isn't happening with him, but that's just, sometimes it's also an extra level of respect factor when it comes to the guys with the the letter on their chest or who are talking to the officials. So you have some of these older players uh, other than like a Larkin, like a Perron or Sherratt, for instance, if they're wearing the A, they've got relationship with most of these guys out there and know how how to handle things and bring those things back and forth to the team. It's just, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I don't, I haven't seen too many people complain under the fact other than the fact that they want him to have it. And I, I can't argue that, that concepts it's, if it happens, it happens. Great. If not, just be patient. It's not, it's not the end of the world. If he doesn't have an A on his chest this year or next. Yeah. We don't need to rush into anything. I think into your point, I think it will be a guy like probably Andrew cop. Andrew cop has been uh, an, an, alternate captain and for other teams. Yeah. Ben Schrott has been named as a leader in the room by several players. And I think he'll, he'll probably get an a Perron's worn an a he's won. He has the, he has the experience. I mean, Michael Rasmussen wore an a during some of the preseason. And I think so, so did Zadina. So, well, so did Philip Ronick. Yeah. So there's several choices out there. I do think you will probably see most Levets getting it to close out on the Elmer Soderblom topic before we go on to the other part of the roster. Elmer Soderblom, we are giving away with Vintage Detroit an Elmer Soderblom home jersey. All you have to do is go to our Twitter page and look at our pinned post. If you like it and retweet it and tag two of your friends in it, you are entered. If you do the same thing over on our Instagram at Grindline Pod, you will also get another entry there. Again, an Elmer Soderblom home jersey. It is not Soderblom size. Otherwise, it would fit like six people inside of it. It will be whatever size you are because our friends at Vintage Detroit are completely restocked now. Every size of home and away. So if you're looking for a jersey and you've been waiting a little bit because stock's been funky, they do have stuff back in stock. Lynn is amazing. She sent us an email the other day. So with them, we are giving away a jersey. So go enter the contest. Uh, Spread that contest around and yeah, just uh, get it out there and good luck. Hopefully you win. But on to defensemen. We're going there out on Friday, by the way, to finish Detroit. Woo! We're going Friday? Well, you're going Friday. I'm going to be there Friday. You're going Friday. I got shit to do on Friday. I got a lot of shit to do, too. So while Tyler talks to his mom, we will go through the defensemen that have made the roster. Uh, Ali Mata, Ben Sherratt, Philip Ronick, Gus Lindstrom, Robert Haig, Moritz Seider, and Jordan Osterley. The notable omission, of course, is Simon Edvinson. He was sent to Grand Rapids. In his place is Jordan Osterley. That makes me have a very big sad face because Jordan Osterley is not great. And even though, even if you were to just put him on the third pair with Gus Lindstrom, and give him some power play time, probably quarterbacking power play too. I think it would still make the team better than playing Jordan Osterley and just going now, nah, throwing your hands up in the air. I don't think it's going to be Osterley. I think it's going to be Hag. Or H- is it Haig? Robert Haig? Robert no, Haig. Haig, there we go. Led the league know. in hits for most of the season. I think it's going to be Haig season. and Lindstrom, honestly, back there. I don't think Osterley... Osterley is simply there because I Haig came back. 
I think if Haig was still out injured, we'd be talking about Edmondson being there with Osterley still as the odd man out. Okay, I could see. I think it. I'd be okay if I never saw Osterley play again, to be quite honest with you, but that's just me. I think we said last season, if Jordan Osterley scores on your team, you are required by NHL law to relocate, right? You have to, you have to sell the team and go somewhere else. Now, before we keep going on defense, the goalies, of course, Vili Huso and Alex Nedeljkovic, we knew it was going to be them going in. But I think that was a big surprise and maybe not a surprise. And we're not a, we're not against it, guys. We, we do not give a shit if Edvinson spends the entire season in Grand Rapids. It's good no. for his development. We don't it care. It would have been what Cider did. The only reason we were disappointed or I was disappointed was because he outperformed a couple other people who made the team. Even though he had some stuff to work on, which I chalk up to a speed difference between the two leagues and smaller ice, which it should for a guy with his skill should be no problem. It should be no problem for him to work on those couple things, even yeah. during the season, maybe 10, 15 games, get him up to speed, which again, top line minutes like top pair in the AHL should get him that until there is an injury and he is called up. But the problem we're running into now is that when Jake Wallman comes back, what happens? When Mark Pissick comes back, what happens? With forwards, when Robbie Fabry comes back, what happens? Because now, well, with Robbie Fabry, you're going to send one of Joe Valeno or Elmer Soderblom to the minors, which is yep. fine, I guess. That, makes, that's, that one turns, into be, turns out to be an easy decision. But on defense, it gets a little harder. So I could say, well, when Pissick comes back, I could tell you Robert Haig is probably the only reason that he was signed was because Pissick had an injury. So we're like, oh, was shit. he signed after the fact? Uh, I believe so. I think was he? he was. Yeah, I think he was picked up after they found out Pissick was injured. Okay. So that's OK. That's fine. But when Pissick comes back, are you waving Hag? Are you waving Lind- uh, Lindstrom? Are you waving Jordan Osterley? Because then you're waiting for another injury. Osterley, duh. But then again, if you want to play Edvinson this season, you're waiting for another injury. You're waiting for Pissick to get injured again. You're waiting for Ben Sherratt to have a mystery injury. You're waiting for Oli Mata to have a mystery injury. And again, I don't care if Edvinson spends the entire season in the AHL. It will help him develop. The AHL is a developmental league. It's beautiful. Beautiful how those things work. And they're going to have a killer team. I, I would want Edvinson to be on the team if he's ready to be on the team. If he's not ready to be on the team, that's one thing. If he's ready to be on the team and they're just holding him out for whatever reason, I, that I don't agree with. And that, that would be one of the first times it's something that Steve Eisenman does that I wouldn't agree with. Um, but, you know, we don't know that. We don't know what the reasoning is for him getting sent down. Is it because, you know, they 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 think that he's – He's ready, but they want to give him more time in, in the AHL to, or sorry, time in the AHL to figure out um, the the smaller ice surface style, or or is it is it is it that, or, is, or do they really just think he's not ready and, and he needs a, a year in the AHL or at least half a year? What I think it is is that they want him, and they had kind of said it before, they want him to have as many minutes as possible, and I think. That the, the thinking, if I was on the Red Wings management team, my thinking here would be send him to Grand Rapids and play him top pair. Because even playing him third pair in Detroit, he's not going to get the minutes that you want him to get. Even if you give him special teams, you want him to at least be second pair on the Red Wings in order to get the same quality of development that he would get in Grand Rapids with higher minutes. You can get me, you can cut... I don't know. You can cut five minutes a night and stay in Detroit and the competition or development curve should still be about the same than adding those five minutes and putting him in the AHL. But if you're putting him on the third pair, he's not going to get those minutes. So I think that's kind of that would be my rationale behind it. Yeah, I think he's one of the few guys you can say that you saw consistent improvement throughout the preseason from his first game up until his final game. For as much as people bitched. Yeah. And I mean, you could see that, like, to, like you mentioned, things were coming at him quickly and the reaction time when he had space was great, but he would let guys get way too tight. And much like the prospect tournament, um, the turnovers would happen. 
And then that is makes it that's more difficult on your team. And those were just the learning things. And I feel like he got better with that as the preseason went on. They were happening, but they started happening less because he had started getting used to the speed. Going to the AHL, he's still going to get very similar speed on the same type of ice. Like you said, he's going to get those top minutes on the power play, penalty kill. He's going to be an all situations guy where the difference is right now is he's if he was staying in Detroit, power play and PK time was going to be very hard to come by for him, especially the power play, because you've got Sherratt rotating there on at times, but Cider's there is their number one. If they're rolling four forwards, so there's one, you're not on one unit. Second unit, more than likely Heronic. So supplanting either of those guys wasn't going to happen. And then now you're looking at PK. That's the, probably the more obvious route that he could have went. Tyler's taking pictures of us. Um, but yeah. <laughs> my dad asked me what I was doing. So I said, no. so you could have seen him maybe on the PK route because there's a high, more high, like what's the word I'm looking for? Shift, shift changing there. But even still, it wasn't as likely. So you put him in all situations in Grand Rapids. That's your best case scenario for now. Even though I may not be a fan of it, I get it. I think that. You're right. You, he would have had to have been able to assert Philip Hronik for PP2. And penalty kill, with how he had the turnovers in preseason, penalty kill would have been rough for him to get a spot there until he tightened that up, which is fine. And again, he could spend the entire season in Grand Rapids, and I, I wouldn't care. I think be, before, so before we get to the last bigger roster announcement, I want to take our our quick commercial break before we do that. And we go to the kind of Max's news from the day. So uh, we'll be right back in just one minute. Hockey fans, it's finally time to hit the ice again. And thanks to DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, you're in for the season of a lifetime. New customers can bet $5 on any team and get $200 in free bets if they win. If that wasn't enough excitement, you can turn small bets into bigger payouts with same game parlays. You like Dylan Larkin this season, maybe you think he's going to score a bunch, help you win. You can use things like that, combining multiple bets like which team will win, how many goals will be scored, and more for your shot at an even bigger payout. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. You can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now, use promo code THPN, bet $5 on any NHL team to win their game, and get $200 in free bets if they do. That's code THPN at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. The minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, and we're back. And before we get to this, okay, let's do this first. Sebastian Cosa is a Grand Rapids Griffin. That is awesome. Uh, he earned it. He played play. great. I mean, he's in Grand Rapids. He was signed to Grand Rapids. I know, but there's still the offshoot chance that that could still change. So I'm waiting for the season to start knowing that he's there to be like, yes, because I've heard that that may not necessarily be the case. Well, he looked really good in preseason. Oh, and I he totally looked agree. good in prospect tournament. And I think he deserves to play. And UCL Kenora also looked good. Bradstrom looked good for stretches. The last game did not. So it, we'll see what happens. But uh, he was assigned to Grand Rapids. Now they could have said that he was assigned to his junior team. They did not do that. They could send him to the walleye. I hope they don't because I think players flounder as another fish for you in the ECHL. Um, but I don't think that I don't think that that would be the best path. So I'm really hoping that he gets some quasi. I killed Ryan with that joke. You were so <laughs> proud of yourself on that one. And it just you're, went so smoothly. I feel like you had a you, had a, you, have a, you got a dad joke board right there or something that you just want to check off because you just kept going. Didn't miss a beat, and I just knew it. You loved it. It was amazing. But I really hope that he he plays with Grand Rapids and does well, because I don't think there would be any better move for Sebastian Costa's confidence than to just give him some solid starts in the AHL and just have him fucking knock it out of the park. And I think that would be absolutely amazing for him. And I'm really rooting for him because he seems to have turned it around in dramatic fashion from a year ago when we saw him even though he did really well with his junior team, did really well through the playoffs and then carried that on into the prospect tournament and spent the summer working with the Red Wings staff. And I think it's really starting to pay off for him. So super excited to see what happens there. And I really hope that he does get quality starts in Grand Rapids. It will help the timeline too. 
because you look at the contracts and where things are at with Ned and Huso. If he can do what we're hoping he can do, and that confidence of his may, is maintained, like we, we could see him in Detroit in, within three years. I'm three, I'm being generous on. I, I think, think that's the plan. Most appropriate. But if that's how things work out, especially if he's in Grand Rapids this season, there's your goaltender to the future. You've got your mainstays of this roster, the future already being in place and or in Grand Rapids with Cosa. Here we go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the fact that he didn't get sent back to junior is a telling sign that they think that he's ready to take the the jump from going from juniors to at least pro hockey, uh, whether it be the AHL or I, I hate this idea, but the ECHL, I'm kind of with Greg. I think the ECHL is one of those leagues where it's, um, it's, it's a lot of guys that played D one college hockey and aren't going to go any further than the ECHL. And then some, some prospects, but for the most part, it's just guys that, are major projects or guys that are just trying to play a little bit of extra hockey that are good enough to do so. So I don't think it's a great developmental league either, um, especially for a goalie. I just, I, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, with that being said, I think the AHL is fantastic, especially if he's up to that speed, which we've kind of seen. Uh, I mean that him being the one B there, or I guess I, I hope he's not the one C cause it seems like they have three goalies right now. Right. Okanora, Bradstrom, and, and him. So, I mean, I, is, there's there's still an opportunity for maybe a trade to happen. I, I don't know if if they want to do that or if they want to carry three goalies. I I would think that if they if they're if they're going to put him on the Grand Rapids team, he's going to get playing time. He's not going to be one of these guys that that's the third goalie and doesn't play at all. He's going to have to be the th- the second or first goalie. Um, I don't think he'll be the starter, but I mean, he's going to have to be, you know, the the second goalie at least. Otherwise, you send him back to junior because, I mean, what's the point of having him sit behind two guys? Yeah, and that and that plays right into the Edmondson thing too. Where you, Greg, you mentioned it. It's all about those minutes, and they hammered that one home with Kosa in particular because if he's not playing, he's not improving, and he's not. That's just not what they want for his development right now. That's why I'm hopeful that he does stay in Grand Rapids in three days from now, he's on the bench there either or on the ice. It depends on who's, who's the starter. I, w- I want to assume that it's probably going to be one of Bradstrom or Okanora, but if he's there, that's what you hope for. Could you imagine if he was the starter night one Grand Rapids? Oh, that, I mean, that'd be one way to keep people from trying to make their way to Detroit. I'll tell you what, man, that would be one hell of a, a, a spot to go, to go from, you know, a starting goalie in juniors to a starting goalie in the AHL right away. I mean, that's, that's something that can happen in, you know, it, at the forward, you know, position or, or at defense, but you know, that hardly ever happens in, in, in the, at the goaltending position. So that's, that right. would be something that would be kind of unheard of. And I, I heard the guys on NHL network radio talking. I listen to those guys pretty often. And they were saying something about why can't the goalie position be a position where you can have a younger guy? Why is it one of these things where it has to take three years? Some guys, absolutely. And some guys, you know, it's it's one of those things where you have to take your time with it. But then there's some guys that are just ready. And it's it's maybe you're going to see it more often now because the league's getting younger. Why isn't it getting younger? And that, that's my question. Yeah, I mean, it's faster. The shots are a lot better. Not saying they're not that great in juniors, but the skill level is is unmatched. And you've got in the junior level, you're looking at a more specific region. You're not looking so much worldwide per se. I'm not. I, I'm generalizing, of course. I know that there are players from Europe, Russia, what have you, in juniors over here. But the likelihood of them being here is a little bit lower than say you're starting to get in the pro ranks, and that's where you jump to the AHL. In the NHL, you're seeing those top play- players from the international ranks now on one spot, and it's a different level of hockey that they're not accustomed to in the juniors. Yeah, I just look at it as a distillation of talent. 
you're when you are in juniors, you're playing, you're playing a bunch of guys that will never make an NHL team or an AHL team. Their their juniors will be their last stop. And you're taking the best players from there and you're moving them to the AHL. So you're further distilling the talent where you're going to face harder, more high quality shots every single night. And then again, from the AHL, you're facing a bunch of guys who will never see the NHL. And to move from that level to the next one, you're again, you're distilling the talent. You're facing even faster players, even more skilled players, even higher quality shots. But when you're the goalie, your only job is to stop those people. When you're a forward, you're skating with them. When you're a defenseman, you're defending with and against them. But the goalie is the last line of defense. And it's, I mean, arguably the hardest position to play on the ice. So when you have to distill that talent over and over and over again, the goalies just take that much more development time to be confident enough to hit that level or be good enough to hit that level. So I agree lot. with you, but I, I do think that, you know, as the game gets younger and the game gets, uh, I, I hesitate to say faster because faster hockey doesn't always mean better hockey. Um, you know, that that's, that's one thing that, you know, a lot of people will say, Oh, the game's getting faster. It's, it's getting more entertainment at one point or another. It's going to get to a point where it's just kind of like running around for no reason. Uh, and I think we're we're not there yet, but I think we're getting to that point where uh, the game is kind of getting too fast. Mickey Redmond said it for a long time, and I happen to agree with him. The game is getting to the point where it's way too fast. So the attention to detail is not there. There's a lot more mistakes. And and obviously the game is a lot harder. But in terms of of, of goaltending, I mean, yeah, the, the path has always been long. But just because it's always been done that way doesn't mean it has to continue doing. No, it sure. And way. if you but but the thing is, is, if you go younger and they're not ready, you're going to blow the confidence of a ton of goalies. And that is going to further water down the league. It's of course, it's going to increase scoring, but you're going to have a lot of really, really pissed off teams. So. It's not, and it's not going to stop the, some of these younger guys from moving up faster. Like we said, Kosa, 19 years old, right? About to be in the AHL. We hope not that, mad at it. It's not, he's not getting held back right now. And he know he's, he sees these other young guys like Carter Hart, Spencer Knight in particular have made that jump. It wasn't immediate, but they've done it. And they're Jake young. Ottinger's another guy. I mean, he exactly. played at Boston so university for, I think he played two years there and then, Ended up with Texas for, I think, a half a year and, you know, dominated in the Stanley Cup playoffs. If the Stars could score any goals in that playoff series, they would have moved on to the second round. So it's it's he's not the, the odds are in his favor at this point. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So I want to go on to these tweets before we close out the night. We actually might not have time to go to our actual predictions, but and Ryan, I saved you. Uh, the roster was already released, so we don't have to do our projection. Uh, so you're you're saved on that one. Uh, we were, Wait, remember, which one? Last week, we were dreading making you project the roster. Yeah, you know, that's We fantastic. don't have to because the roster is released. Love uh, it. But Max Boltman had some tweets today from practice forwards today. The lines looked as so. Bertuzzi, Larkin, Raymond, Peron, Kopp, Verana, Kubelik, Rasmussen, and Zadina and Ernie were alternating on the third line. Fourth line was Soderblom, Suter, and Valeno were alternating at center, and Sunquist. He said he can't really tell who is centering the fourth line and who is rotating. So what that tells me is it could be one of either Suter or Valeno sitting as fourth line center. I mean, he went on to do power play units. Power play one was Bertuzzi at net front, Peron, Larkin, and Raymond, and Sider. It said Bertuzzi and Raymond seem to be switching between net and right flank, which is fine. Power play two, though, Soderblom was at net front. You had Kopp, Verana, and Kubelik in the middle and Hironic quarterbacking. So I like that second unit. It's a great unit. And we had talked about that. We said, well, maybe we thought maybe you would put Verana maybe on power play one. But it looks like Peron's going to be on power play one to maybe add a little bit more grit to that power play. You have three righties on that first power play. He's clutch, Three. too, though. Yeah, yep. So, but power play, too, of course you're going to throw Soderblom in front of the net. It's like putting six guys in front of the other goalie. So, I think that if if someone has to go, 
and they say, hey, Suter, you're in, I think Valeno sits. Now, that doesn't mean he's sent back to Grand Rapids. He's on the 23-man roster, but I think he sits, which is, I mean, not bad because you're still on the team, but because of Soderblom's, and we talked about this, his usefulness on a situation like a power play, I think that's where he's going to stick on the roster, at least until there's an injury or until someone comes back from injury. Sorry, but yeah, it, his carryover, the hands in tight it, this preseason from all the highlights and things that we've seen building up to this point, that's what basically locked him into that net front role. It's what we envisioned, I would say, Rasmussen being when we saw him. That, sh- sh- hold on. What we saw with Raz as the net front guy in juniors before he got to Detroit and Grand Rapids, that's what we're hoping to see more of in terms of what Soderblom's doing now. That's what we're kind of hoping with Raz a little bit, where you get him in front of the net, you're not going to stop him. That turned out to not necessarily be the case. He's still great there, don't get me wrong, but Elmer takes it to a whole new level. And for a guy being 6'8", it's not fair. And we saw that the other night when he had the deke through the defense and the backhand beauty sauce to, for the goal off the post. So it's it's a whole new element and skill that we haven't seen in a while. Yeah, I was going to say, um, first of all, I, I kind of agree with Rasmussen, but I thought you were going somewhere else with that. I thought you were going to say another big guy that we we formerly had in Anthony Mantha, because I feel like. Mantha's strength was shooting the puck, but I think everyone wanted him to be that guy that like, we're going to have our second Thomas Holmstrom reference uh, in the podcast, something that I never thought I would say. Um, But, but here it is. Uh, And, you know, those guys are valuable. We we haven't had a player like that in a long time. Uh, Tyler Bertuzzi does it at a lesser level because, you know, he's a smaller guy. But uh, in terms of like big guys in front of the net, we haven't had a guy like that. And not that Holmstrom was the biggest guy in the, in the world, but he was a beast at tipping the puck in front of the net. And I mean, again, we wanted Anthony Mantha to be that. We wanted him to be that net front guy. And it just kind of never materialized. Soderblom, I think where he benefits is, is he can really screen the goal. I mean, you can't see shit. Well, I'm not even... I don't even care if he screens the goalie. It's when he has the puck that I'm more intrigued by. Like if he's putting screens, putting screens on and making deflections. Great. But that puck's loose in front. Good luck getting it from him. The other thing too, is, is I kind of look to, I don't know if he's going to be down low or he's going to be like in the bumper position, like kind of like the Bruins run or a team like Tampa runs, but Um, Like, I'm curious to see what the power play is going to look like in terms of, um, you know, um, organization and, and, um, you know, strategy. I wonder if it's still going to be that one, three, one, or if they're going to run something a little bit different. I think based on what Max put there, what we saw a little bit, they're doing the one, three, one, because I know Perron wasn't, they had him going, they had a lot of guys going through the middle and doing, doing a lot of bumper work and things of that nature. And then try or trying to get, get the wing down toward the red line and then work. They're working a lot of triangle stuff throughout preseason. I think that's going to kind of continue on. That's where you're seeing. Which I don't think it did last year. I think it was a lot more perimeter shit, them passing it around, not getting enough shots, not getting enough traffic. I mean, we haven't had a good power play in a long time. So um, it's been a while since we've been a top 10 power play, I would say. And that's without looking at it. But I, I can I can tell you for sure, even going back to the last couple playoff teams, the, those weren't good power plays either. So, um, you know, it's been a long time since we've had a good power play. So interested to see Soderblom in front of the net down there. Yeah, and that's one of the things that Derek Lalone kept bringing up is we need to improve special teams. And that's why I think Alex Tangay was kept around because I truly believe that he started doing his thing and we saw it last, not this preseason, but last preseason where the power play was looking good. And then during the season, it kind of failed a couple times. And then it seems like it it went back to the old garbage power play. And I think what happened is Blash kind of took the reins of it and didn't let uh, Tange do what he needed to do. So with Tange still in charge, I think there is still and, and it to his credit, he's the only one that was kept around. So you got to look at it and say, hey, clearly he was doing something right or he was being held back. The same with Bob Bugner is. Sharks had the best penalty kill in the league 
for a long time. And there was an article that came out about improving the penalty kill and how Lalone, what he did is he studied the Sharks power play and improved the Tampa uh, or the Sharks penalty kill and improved Tampa's penalty kill from one of the worst in the league to one of the best or the best. So he's hoping to do that same thing here in Detroit. And the advantage, I guess, that he has is we took the guy who worked with the Sharks. So you go instead of just copying the Sharks plan, you go get the Sharks guy and have him implement the system. So I think that's the one thing we're going to have to look at is is penalty kill and power play. But I think, like you said, Soderblom is a guy who doesn't really have to try very hard to screen the goalie. And you should see stuff start going in. And I did during preseason to their to their credit. I saw an improved power play. I saw an improved penalty kill. I saw a far improved penalty kill to the point where they were doing the power kill. They were becoming very aggressive. They are aggressive. They were turning it into chances for themselves. They were controlling the puck. I think it was the last preseason game of, of the, the last game of the preseason where they were on a penalty kill. And I don't think that Toronto got a shot on net because they just controlled the puck the entire time. So it's really impressive to see. And hopefully that that carries in, because if you're trying to get to that over 90 point threshold, you're going to have to stop pucks on the power play. Uh, So it's just what what you're looking to do. So I think that that is where Soderblom is probably going to find his in at the beginning of the season is getting it on special teams. And that's where Joe Valeno is probably going to be sat if it comes down to the two of them, because there's not really a position for him on the power play or the penalty kill. You know what's crazy? I was just randomly looking at stats. So Detroit finished, if I saw it correctly, 16% power play last year. That was 26th in the league. The year they won the Cup, 0708, 20.7%, which was third in the league. Yeah, special teams are like super important. <laughs> like there are things that you have to be really, really good at to be successful. And when you when you're in the bottom now, that's the other thing that you got to look at, too. When you're at the bottom of the league in penalty kill and you take a lot of penalties, that's not a recipe for success. So that that's the other thing you got to look at is also tightening up your game and taking less penalties. You also look at the PK, like you said, 73.8 percent last year, 32nd. That Stanley Cup team, Stanley Cup winning team, 84 percent. Now, that's not I don't know if that includes playoffs. That's their regular season, I do believe. but for the 0708 stats that tells you what it takes to be a top team. Cause what, what is it that most people look at? You have to get to that hundred, hundred percent mark. The closer you are to that, the likely better you are doing in the season. Yep. I would agree because it's again, when you're down a person, you've got to kill it because, or it'll kill you. Those are the two, those are the two options. Got it. Uh, uh, I kind of just really quickly want to glance over what Max had put out his kind of predictions for standings, not points wise. But he does have the Detroit Red Wings as sixth in the Atlantic behind Toronto, Tampa, Florida, Boston and Ottawa. I personally still think Ottawa is very overrated and I don't think they're going to do as well as people think they are going to do. I think hmm. they still have a lot of work to do, but I I could see us outpacing Ottawa this season. and again. Boston is starting with some pretty decent injuries. I mean, McAvoy is injured. Isn't Marshawn injured again? So they're going to yeah, have some Marshawn's players. Marshawn's out. Um, what he do? McAvoy's out. He he got surgery in the offseason. McAvoy oh, got surgery. Oh, that's right. Offseason. I know. I knew. I knew McAvoy. They're weird. They like waved Mike Riley. Like Mike Riley was one of their better defensive defensemen last year. They waved him. They waved Felino, and I, none of those guys got claimed, which is kind of surprising too. Yeah, I think Riley was the one that was surprisingly didn't get claimed, and he was the one that a bunch of the Boston fans were pissed off about because they're like behind McAvoy, like Riley with McAvoy out. Riley's probably going to be one of your better defensemen, and you're waving him to send him to the AHL. It doesn't make sense. So Boston seems to be making some maybe early roster missteps, and they're going to be missing a couple, at least a couple of their key players. Now they did get. Uh, Krejci back so that should be a boost for them but to have I mean your best defenseman on your team out for probably a decent portion of the season not decent portion but at least the beginning of the season and same with one of your best goal scorers and top line player in Marshan 
I could see Boston maybe lagging behind a little bit to start the season, which may give us an advantage. So I agree with Montreal being last in the Atlantic. Montreal will probably be towards the bottom of the entire league. I do agree with Buffalo below us. They're a really young team. They got a lot of talent. They got to put it together. But I could also see us beating Ottawa. And again, Boston, this is one of their last runs before they really have to rebuild this team and start tearing stuff down. I just see the thing is I've I've talked to a lot of people here. You know, obviously you guys know I live here in Boston or close enough anyways. A lot of my friends and family are Bruins fans and it, it kind of seems like they're they're kind of like what we were um you know when, when the playoff streak ended and stuff like that. Like they still want to continue winning. Like they, they don't want to go through a long rebuild. The owner is kind of the same way. They don't, they're not going to go through, you know, a, a huge rebuild. Now they, their hand might get forced kind of like Detroit's did, but I mean, they just seem to kind of want to hang on and, and then build around like Pasternak and McAvoy, which is like, I mean, you don't have a center to build around like Patrice Bergeron. Patrice Bergeron was like one foot out the door uh, and, and they reeled them back in by firing Cassidy. So I don't know that, that that organization's in big time disarray. Didn't like, Pasternak say he wasn't going to stay if Sweeney was the GM? I think he, I think it that was, was the rumor. Yeah, I think it had something to do with that. Also, he was one of the one guys uh, in the Bruins organization that like wanted them to keep Cassidy. Yeah, I think they're going to have it's possible that next season they're going to have a rude awakening because Krejci came back for the season I, he, there's no saying he's going to stay around for next. I don't think Bergeron is going. I mean, he's going to have to, even though he's still one of the top centers in the league, he's going to have to retire. Like eventually you've got enough money and you're putting enough strain on yourself that just for your own health, it's better to retire. Yeah. From my understanding, it has to do a lot to do with like his family and like they don't want to continue to do this well that so, was the same thing with Krejci too Krejci wanted his family to be over in his like the country he grew up in so that I don't understand what brought him back then now talking about David Krejci I love David Krejci one of my favorite hockey players that I've ever watched not on the Detroit Red Wings so I mean for to see him play again that's cool but like I mean what what brought him back like do they really think they're gonna go I don't I think a lot of it is trying and this might just be me guessing. I think a lot of it is them trying to entice Pasternak to stay and not leave because there's no contract. I have not seen a projected number for Pasternak. I have not seen an offer he's been given or anything. And again, there was the report of him being not happy with Sweeney and that if he was going to be the GM that he might leave. And then Sweeney got extended so like they fired their coach, who was a good coach, and they kept their general manager, which from what I can gather, not a bunch of people in Boston are super happy with. And even the players, some players are not happy with. So maybe you bring Krejci back to reunite the gang and get morale up and make Pasta happy so that maybe he resigns. From what I've heard, a lot of people like that are knowledgeable about, you know, not unrealistic Bruins fans, like the, the realistic ones are kind of like us. They can call a spade a spade. They want the whole thing, just, just napalm, the whole thing, the whole hockey operations, even a guy like Cam Neely that's been there for a long time. They want the whole thing blown up. So I don't know if that's going to happen, but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, so before we sign off tonight, I just want to give a big fuck you to Hockey Canada. Uh, they're a giant piece of shit organization. They Bauer just dropped them. Uh, and Bauer is no longer sponsoring Hockey Canada men's. They will still be sponsoring women. They said men can buy this stuff from us. That's what they said. So, uh, yep, that, wow. that happened today. They found out there was a second uh, slush fund using junior fees to cover up sexual assault stuff. So, yeah, uh, big middle finger to Hockey Canada. That entire organization needs to be burnt to the ground and restructured. But I want to get you guys' final thoughts before we sign off and go into the season because we will be at the home opener on Friday and our next episode will not be recorded until Monday. So there will be a Red Wings game by the next time we record. And we are going to start tonight with Tyler. Yeah, I mean, final thoughts. I'm looking forward to it. I mean, we're getting 
we're a couple of days away from the home opener. We're going to all be down there. Um, I think we're hitting Harry's, right? Is that the plan? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Uh, we'll oh, yeah. see we're going you guys all at Harry's. And if we don't, we'll see you at the game um, for the picture. What is it going to be after the first period in front of the team store? I think that's beginning what of the said. first intermission in front of the team store. Yes. Everyone come see us and say hi to us. I'll have pockets full of stickers. Sounds good. But yeah, th- those are my final thoughts. I'm really looking forward to to seeing these guys. Hopefully somehow we get this Dylan Larkin thing done before then. I don't know, but but we'll see what happens there on that front. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at SealDog91. Looking forward to seeing everybody. Yep, my final thoughts are pump C, folks, especially Tyler. It's going to be fun having you and your dad in town. It's going to be a jam-packed weekend, but uh, it'll be good. I'm just excited to get to a game and have some fun. Hopefully remember it. Actually, I have to remember it because I have to I have to get my ass up and that you a got shit game. to do on Saturday, right? <laughs> I have so much stuff to do Saturday. I, I I don't I can't afford to be hung over in any sense of the way word. Uh, it'd be so bad. I'd be I'd be in so much trouble there. There would be a murder and Tyler, you'd have to figure out your way for the weekend. But <laughs> no, it'll be it'll be great. I can't wait to go to the game, hang out with folks that we haven't seen forever and just be great. No wooing. No wooing. No wooing. It is the worst. Fight after a goal. Cool. Do it then. Not in the middle of the gameplay. It's the only reason why I hate it. Anyways, already Ryan 33. Didn't do that at Joe Louis Arena, did we? No. So, Ever. <laughs> so my final thoughts are, again, yes, we will be at opening night. Yes, you can come say hi to us. Uh, shoot us a message Harry's. on Twitter. Yeah, come to Harry's before the game. We will have a big group there. Shoot us a message on Twitter to find us in the arena. We'll be hanging out at some point with Daniela Bruce. If I can convince Jen to hold off a little bit during first intermission, Daniela will take a picture with the entire group. Uh, she said as soon as they are done broadcasting their uh, little thing, get their game day live segment after the first period. She could show up, so she's free. After Usually, it's that. the first what five six minutes of the period. Yep. So that's actually enough time to like get everyone together and set up and everything. So I could get Daniela in the picture. I'll have to let Jen know. But yeah, come stop by, say hi, get a sticker, get a picture with us. I want to post a bunch of pictures on Twitter from that night. You can follow me online at Bringing the Wing. You can follow the Grindline Podcast online at Grindline Pod. Remember to go enter our Elmer Sodoblom jersey giveaway contest on our Twitter page and Instagram. We have to give a shout out to the Hockey Podcast Network for hosting us and spreading our podcast around. Also to Vintage Detroit for being an awesome, just, I mean, a bunch of awesome people. The only place you should get your Detroit jerseys from and worked on. They are fantastic. If you use the promo code GRINDLINE at Howie's Hockey Tape, you'll get 10% off your order. And if you use that same promo code at Bring Hockey Back, you'll get 12% off your order. You can also check out our merch at redbubble.com by searching the GRINDLINE. There will be new designs going up this season as it progresses. And go sub to our YouTube. Go to YouTube, search us out, sub to us. We will have more video content coming throughout the entire season, not just our episodes. We also just hit 500 subs, so thank you to everyone. We will turn on that community feature shortly and be able to interact with people on YouTube. Um, But that's going to do it for us tonight. So for Ryan and Tyler, I am Greg. Go Wings. Happy hockey season, everyone. And you stay classy hockey. What? You kept going. Yeah, I did. I liked it. You stay classy, Hockey Town. Go Wings.